of all, to you both, congratulations for making such a potent film and doing so with, in such a pithy way with Hume. I really enjoyed it, so um, a big congratulations again. Um, and yeah. Exactly. And just while you've got your hands out, um, I think a round of applause as well for, for this festival and these programmers for continually finding films from first time directors that take on issues. Not all festivals do, so congratulations to these and film festivals as well. I'll tell you the story of how we ended up at the, the, the East End Film Festival. It was literally, we sort of were sitting there, finished uh, editing our film away, and I uh, just sort of, someone had mentioned it. I thought, oh, you know what, I'm just going to give them a call. I'm just going to call up. And it happened uh, that, that Alison picked up the phone and we said, we've got this film. And I just described it to her, and she went, yes, I like that film. Uh, and, and it was that, we never thought it would be that simple, but it, it kind of was. And you just completely took a punt on it, and, and it was, you know, that, that was a very brave decision to make. And thank you for doing that, because it could have been shy. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, if, if you don't mind indulging me a bit, I've got just a couple of questions to, to kick stuff off. Um, and to just to kind of go around the humour a bit and to kind of drill down into the, to, to the devil, the psychology of the devil a bit. Um, you, I think, have either described yourself or you've been described as a recovering tabloid hack. Can I ask how you think one contracts the disease in the first place? Um, uh, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not so much a disease. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with tabloid journalism in itself. Tabloid journalism in its essence is, is, is just popular journalism. But unfortunately, what's occurred, to my mind, is that tabloid journalism has moved away from its roots. When you look at the, how the mirror used to be, it was a really brave investigative newspaper that was a tabloid. And, you know, some people have described it as an anti-tabloid film. I don't think that is fair at all, because it's not, you know, I, I love tabloid journalism, I love journalism, I hate what tabloid journalism have become, which is mainly just a, uh, really just a celebrity, drivel, sort of PR guff experience that, that has very little news in it at all, and, and you know, for journalists entering the industry, uh, very talented people with very good qualifications, their opportunities are limited to writing captions at Mail on mail online bikini picture pieces, and I think that's wrong. I don't think that that's what we should be training people up to do because that's the only opportunities that exist, and I think that's a massive problem. So, you know, I, I, I don't like you know, I don't like to describe it as a disease because I think that good journalists should become tabloid journalists. I think the conditions they're being asked to work under is, is a real problem of not letting them do what they're trained to do and what they want to do. Sure. Um, and do you detect, I mean, it's, it's a, it, you're relatively fresh from the fight in that sense, it's not so long since you left. Do you no. detect either from former colleagues, your own experience, and what's going on further afield with Leveson, post Leveson, do you detect any, any meaningful cultural change back to the type of tabloid journalism that you, that you value and would like to see? No. Um, <laughs> simple answer. Um, no, it, I, I was massively disappointed. Um, I'll admit, with the reaction of a lot of Fleet Street to Leveson, um, the, the way that, you know, when I was working in the industry, that you'd be down the pub appeal from all sorts of newspapers, and they'd be complaining about the, the very conditions they're being asked to work in, and not being able to pursue proper stories, and, and, and just not enjoying um, the job, and feeling a lot of pressure coming downwards on them. And, and, and it disappointed me that when Leveson occurred, and when there seemed to be an opportunity, for, for people to stand up and say, no, this is not what we got into journalism to do, and, and there's an opportunity to change here, that everyone rounded the cuts and, and dismissed the whole process, and, um, it, you know, it's kind of that Stockholm syndrome. The, the very people who are sort of enslaving uh, journalism, they decided to back, and, and very few people decided to speak out. And that's not trying to me to glorify myself, because I did, so much as just, I did expect more people to stick their neck out and actually say, that, you know, what's going on is wrong. And some people did it anonymously. There was, you know, there was very strong evidence that went to the National Union of Journalists anonymously uh, about the conditions. But, you know, overall, there, there was mass cowardice, is what I would call it. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it is sad. But an industry that prides itself on its bravery and, and speaking out and, and speaking truth to power they seemed to lose their voice when it came to speaking truth to power about their own industry. 
Um, one final question before we, we get the questions open to the floor. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick, I feel mandated to stick with the disease analogy. Um, so I think in, in, a, in a slightly different context, um, Guy Fawkes said a desperate disease requires a dangerous remedy. Not Guido Fawkes. Not no, no, Guy no. Fawkes, the, the original and best. Um, <laughs> He's not on the list, is who he? Who engages fireworks and, 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 and uh, baked potatoes and things. Um, the, 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 the remedy, to me, doesn't seem to be coming from anything off the back of Leveson, not the Royal Charter, not the episode stuff. Do you think that the possible conviction and possible incarceration of the likes of Rebecca Brooks could mark a shock moment where that culture may begin, where some kind of, this is open to you, Tom, as well, whether you think, what your assessment is, whether you think that could be a shock, profound moment where this thing may begin to change just a bit? Um, unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't see it making, unfortunately, I, I do feel that money and commerce and everything, unfortunately, is too strong at the moment. Again, I'm probably not the... Rich is probably a better person to answer, but I just don't. I think that will maybe have a slight sway with stuff, but it's much. It's a much huger sort of thing that's happening. With like, I just don't think it's something that will. Imp things will improve, and we will have like. Again, our film maybe is making a small point towards something, and hopefully, but I do worry that we preach to the converted a lot of the time, and that actually the people, you know, the general public buying the papers are just going to. It's incredibly powerful, and I. I'd love to think that it makes a difference, but I have to be kind of, I'm quite an optimist, but it, with this thing, I think I'm slightly negative towards the fact that I just don't think it's hugely going to change. But I mean, again, if, if we, if everyone, if all the converted can try and at least, so it's the problem is, and I think this is what we try to do here, was not be too worthy with the way that, because often people can be like, oh, for God's sake, we know the tabloids are shit, but we'll still buy them, and it's like, so that's why with the film we try to make it fun and slightly stupid because we try to use their techniques to sort of show them up. So rather than going, oh, bastards, you know, they're all wrong. You know, we try to go, well, look, we can do the same thing and make you look like idiots. And I don't know. My point is that I, I don't think it's going to change, but um, I'd love if it did and please everyone to try your best. I mean, uh, <laughs> I feel like I've got to strike a slightly more optimistic note than that. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> We might as well all get. No, I, I, I think that Le Leveson, you know, uh, the, 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 the convictions or not convictions as they may be, um, I don't think, you know, in themselves, the industry have positioned themselves to, they've always tried to limit this. The problem is phone hacking, and the law has now remedied that. There's people on trial, it's now all done. What the hell are you complaining about? The law has, has played its course. And, it, and they've very much tried to focus all of the, the ills that have occurred in the last 20 years on it's about phone hacking. When in fact it's much broader than that. A lot of the things that are going wrong in newspapers have nothing to do with, with illegal behaviour. It's just unethical behaviour. There's nothing illegal about photographing someone's kids uh, when they're out with their parents. But it's just unethical and why would you stick that on a news in a newspaper on a newspaper website and and, and and newspapers are desperate to try and limit their culpability anything against the law when in fact it's a whole broader ethical debate that they really don't want to have because they know that they will lose um, and, and I think that what we try to do in this film a little bit is, is to go how do you like being photographed how do you like someone turning up on your door it's not very nice, is it? So maybe, you know, how, do you, how are you going to react to that? And I, for me, you know, it's not the greatest stunt in the film, but Paul Dacre's security guard being there, stopping anyone even knocking on his door, um, says all you need to know about the sort of people you're dealing with. They don't believe in these principles. They believe in the principles as long as it suits them. And I think that, that that to me is the key point, is that, you know, when it comes to uh, their own lives, they expect privacy, they expect the uppermost protection, but they believe that they can make any excuse to intrude on the other private lives of other people, be they famous or not famous. And, and, and I think, hopefully, to some degree, this film shows that up. Um, and we hope to show up more in the future. Uh, we have more, more things planned. Okay, um, should we get some questions out to the audience? There are two roving mics either side, so um, let's see your questions. Yep, right at the back in the middle. Um, thanks for a brilliant film, I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. And I'd like to uh, suggest that you set up an alternative tabloid newspaper. <laughs> I'm not sure that it could be 
funded by crowdfunding. And it will be absolutely brilliant to present a proper tabloid newspaper again. And uh, it seems to me you're the guy to do it. <laughs> I'd like to suggest also that you take over from Private Eye while you're at it, because I've been really disgusted by you and his lot's attitude to levels, and I've had to stop buying the paper. And, um, I, you know, that leaves a huge gap in the market, but um, we need a Private Eye, but we don't need one with those attitudes. We need one that's not completely run by public schoolboys at a certain age. Um, and I think a tabloid newspaper with humour in it and satire will be a fantastic thing. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think there's a gap in the market too. I, I don't necessarily think that... Um, my bank account is, is allowing it at the moment. Um, it, it's, a, it's a costly exercise. And, it, and I, I think that the print journalism, it takes a, a very full, you know, I wouldn't say foolish, but a very brave investor to put money into print journalism now. You know, me and Tom have, have got other projects lined up along the same lines that we want to do, things that we want to do, because, you know, the digital space, there is a, there is a gap for this sort of stuff. I don't necessarily have to be in print, and, and certainly we are very committed to doing what we what we like to call like comedy journalism, which is trying to do serious stuff with a satirical twist and trying to take on big people, but trying to make it funny, trying to make it um, entertaining for someone who maybe wouldn't normally be engaged with, with the, the sort of issues. And we, and we certainly try to make this film as something that if you knew nothing about press regulation, if you weren't even interested in Leveson, you could watch it on a level of just going, <laughs> he's got a dildo. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so we, we kind of wanted, we kind of wanted to keep that there. And we want to keep on doing stuff that you can kind of hopefully attract people who wouldn't necessarily be interested in weighty sort of stuff. Um, and, and, try, and try and sneak in some little political strong points um, whilst not making that the focus. So, yes, I, I, I thank you. I, I very much thank you. I don't, I, you know, I don't think I'm the heir apparent to Ian Hislop. That, that's very, very kind of you to say. And, and, and I also, as a, as a massive fan of Private Eye, am hugely disappointed in the, in the, in, in the way that they've approached it. Um, you know, I get some of their arguments to a degree, but I think they're, they're wrong. And um, it is disappointing, yes. But you know, even you don't have to necessarily agree with all of your friends on, on everything. And I think that that's uh, that, that's the thing that, that perhaps uh, the whole row we've been following with index on censorship, etc., et in the last week uh, seems to have been forgotten by such individuals as Nick Cohen, uh, whose name we shall not mention. Uh, just a quick supplementary point to that. Um, in terms of there being a, a space in the market, I mean, it may it may not be, you know dildos and, and, and that much fun, but something like the eye paper, you know, the, the spin-off of the, of the Independent, which is a tabloid and which contains, you know, light-hearted content, some celebrity focus, does show, actually, that you can, and it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a considerable success, it's a very successful launch and continuation of the, of the eye paper, so it does show that you can produce a tabloid newspaper which is light and is, 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 is funny and with some celebrity interest without adopting some of the worst elements of, of, of what the type of of, of things that we've seen exposed in this film. So, yeah, there is some to, to be honest, if I set up a tabloid newspaper, the first thing I would do on the first morning is go and send lots of paps down to Hugh Grant's house just to wind him up. <laughs> <laughs> just because just he wouldn't be expecting it, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, there's a question over there. Can we get a mic just over there, just on the, on the right-hand side, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, how you got told of Kelvin's text messages and whether perhaps it's thought to be mentioned in the film. Um, how you got told of the text messages will be taken to my grave. Uh, a journalist must protect his sources. All I can say on the matter is that they were done in a legal an above-board manner, uh, with proper journalistic scrutiny, uh, and nothing more will be said in the matter. Um, you know, I, I can't, anything that I say on it would just give it away, um, and so I can't say anything, and I, and I never have, and I never will. Uh, and so you're just going to have to trust me. I didn't hack anyone's <laughs> phone. That's a good line, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's on the same side, just there. I just wondered if you had any feedback from any of the tabloid editors featured in the film, and have you had any legal threats? 
the most we had was Hugh Witto, the day before we screened it at Sheffield, uh, sent us an email um, that was completely blank. <laughs> so we, we a Pinterest like, threat. Like, yeah, it was just like you know the definition of an empty threat. It really <laughs> was. Like, and we don't know whether he was like really screwing over it. Going, oh, what do I write? What do I write? Oh, fuck, I press it. Oh, you know. <laughs> or whether he was like, I'll just send it and they'll fucking. Have it. Uh, so I don't. Yeah, we don't know. Apart from that, uh, we're still waiting. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's all we've had so far, and again, I don't know if Rich wants to embellish on the fact that if we do have people, I just think at the moment we've not made enough of an issue of it for them to bother because if they do anything, it will only make it, it will only sort of stoke the fire of it. And so at the moment, at the moment, it's thank you so much for coming out, but you're not big enough to make a fucking, you know. Thing for us. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to take that back, that last bit. Uh... <laughs> It's not offending our audience. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I would say to there is bound to be in this room right now, almost guarantee, uh, a lawyer from um, the Daily Mail is uh, probably sitting amongst you right now. I'm almost certain, uh, or at least one newspaper, because I know that they would have sent someone. And all I'm going to say is we look forward to your letters. Um, because we are very, very well protected, and uh, we have legal this film um, as well as could anyone could ever legal a film. Um, and so, if you would like to waste your money trying to send us letters to scare us, you will fail. Um, so please do. Um, just out of interest, um, and it's a, a bit of a confession. How many of you in here do do buy or do read online tabloid journalism? Once a week, a couple of times a week. How many of you? Um, any other questions? So that was just personal interest. Yeah, at the back on the right. Well, can you tell us what your plans are for the film? Where's it going to go, and have you tried it on anybody yet? Have we tried the film on anyone? Um, <laughs> on, on broadcasters. Yes, we, we, we've, um, we've got certainly uh, a lot of interest from, from all over the world for, for showing the film. The, the, to be honest, we never, when we first set out to make this film, we really had no idea of what we were going to do with it. We, we just sort of started off as sort of a pet project, and it's kind of got bigger and bigger, and as people have seen cuts of it, and we never thought we'd get into, you know, really prestigious film festivals like this one, like Sheffield, and, you know, yes, you know, distribu distributors and um, TV channels are interested. I, I think that, you know, what, what is going to stand in our way is, is purely the politics of the fact that a terrestrial broadcaster, like the BBC, should probably show this film. Um, because I think that it's important um, that they do, but they won't. They won't. I can tell you that for a fact, they probably won't. Because they will, however much they, they, they show interest, they will bottle it because they know that they're going to get a load of flack off the Daily Mail um, for showing it, and they'll get a lot of blame um, for that. The, the flack will hit them, not us. And, and I think that's a sad state of affairs. And I think that what may happen is that every country um, in Europe and everywhere else will be able to see this film before you can see it on TV in Britain. And hopefully, just the pure embarrassment of that um, the, the film about the British tabloids you can't see in Britain because our great free speech defenders, uh, the tabloid newspapers, uh, don't want you to see it. I mean, to be honest, that's brilliant. I, I hope that occurs because that is just a, almost like the ultimate stunt of all, is that they try and stop you seeing a film about them um, whilst claiming that they are the bastions of free speech. Perfect. Um, so, yeah. Incidentally, there's something of a precedent for, for what Richard just said. My, my film, my last documentary, won Best Documentary in this festival last year, and our situation was identical. So it is now shown in every country, pretty much around the world, apart from the UK. And there's something deeply gratifying about, A, that happening, because it draws further attention to your film, but then secondly, 
Vimeo, Vimeo On Demand, and the people who want to see it do get to see it, and it's, it's quite an infectious process where people are sharing links. So it's, um, there is, there's something up, quite optimistic to be able to, I mean, people will get the film. Um, we, we are very optimistic. I mean, we've got a, U, like, you know, there's, there's, the US seem amazingly interested in this process. Uh, we had no idea how much interest we'd have from America about this whole, you know, we didn't realise that it was on this scale. And obviously, you'd love the, the idea that perhaps there would be a big audience for it in America, because when it comes to films, that is the, the huge marketplace, and not to say I necessarily will, but there's kind of a chance with what's been, you know, the discussions we've had so far, that it may get, get a, a sort of proper release in America um, to some degree, which would be obviously amazing. But we will see. There's, there's many chats are occurring. Uh, we've spent spend our whole lives just having meetings at the moment about this film, and, and meetings about meetings about meetings, and uh, yeah, but we're content. We're happy. <laughs> No, I'm certain it will be seen um, by whichever means. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, there's, there's several. One in front there. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a great film, Rich. Well done. Uh, I mean, what, what you're talking about is also part of this incredible problem that the industry, which is our primary source of information, because as you know, the broadcast news agenda is largely still set by print. A lot of social media agenda is still set by print. That industry has a massive vested interest in telling a certain story about Leveson, about hacking, about hacked off, about Hugh Grant, about you, about in press, about the whole, this whole issue is bundled <coughs> up. Not just one sided, but a fundamentally inaccurate, distorted lens is applied to the majority of the population's access to this, this whole issue. And you've done a brilliant job of trying to get around that and, and as you say, sort of sabotage it and do something really clever that, that but there's a challenge about the audience. I'm wondering if you've got other ideas about other things other people can be doing to just smash that lens or create an alternative, given that they have the dominant control over the agenda. Um, oh, that's a very good question. Why, why has someone asked a really, really good question? Uh, what can other people do? I mean, you know, um, I, I, I think that, you know, supporting groups like, like Hacked Off and, and, um, and Impress and, you know, trying to talk back at some of the critics and question some of their um, some of their arguments, which are often weak and, and, and just pitiful, really, um, is a starting point. Um, you know, I could say, don't go buying these products. That's not really going to make a huge amount of difference. I don't think they're going to notice 300 people not buying the Daily Mail. I don't really think that many of you probably buy the Daily Mail on a daily basis anyway. But, uh, you know, it's hard. It is hard. What do you do um, against uh, the, a corporation, be it a newspaper corporation or any corporation. It is the massive, we are just individuals and you know the, the world is now comprised of basically a hundred different corporations that own massive controls in one way or another of pretty much bloody everything and how do you challenge that? And, and you know that, that is the fundamental question. I think that filmmaking is a great way to challenge that. And I think that making documentaries that we're very interested in, in sort of doing what we've done in this film against other industries and, and sort of, you know, doing that sort of direct action thing. And I think that where I was a massive fan of Mark Thomas growing up and I think the revolution we televised, that does it to a degree quite well. But it's, there is a problem that a lot of these, these shows have that they end up in the reception area of an office block shouting at a seven pound an hour receptionist and giving him a hard time. And he's just like, gee, I'm just trying to feed my family here. I don't need this whatever stunt you're trying to put. One on the 14th floor is the, you know, is the chief executive getting a blowjob off the secretary and having a, a, a cappuccino and, and not really aware of any of it going on. And I think that what we're really interested in is trying to do further things that really challenge power by investigating who the big people are, where do they eat, where do they drink, what is their life, and trying to somehow insert ourselves in there and trying to do things that are going to personally pull their pants down. And I think that that's something that's not done enough. And yes, it's high risk. And yes, broadcasters don't want to touch with a barge pole because it's just, there are advertisers, there are money. Um, but I think that it's important. I think that these people who, there is the 1% and there is the 99%. And there's too few of the 1% who get someone in their face really going, right, we've got you now. And let, let's, let's have some fun. 
And it doesn't happen often enough. And, and we like to think that that is what, in the next few years, you're going to see us doing more and more of, is, is trying to take some of these people down. Um, and, and we're already sort of planning a few escapades uh, at the moment. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, just to extend that slightly, um, I know I've kind of done some similar things too, and I know there's, it's important. It's, it's important to keep doing that and challenging power in that way. And there is great catharsis if you are, if you happen to be at the cold face of journalism or, or media. There's great catharsis in doing that. But um, do you do you not see any other way that that catharsis could be extended to to anyone? Perhaps people that don't work in the media, people have busy lives, lots of considerations. Is there any way? I know I'm just actually extending the question. That, they, that others can achieve that catharsis? Um, no, don't add it to me because I've just been negative. I just think, yeah, again, it's like, <laughs> like really, uh, stop buying the papers. And in terms of, like I say, in terms of when it is the, you know, stop buying the papers and stop being the sort of, like Kate Smurthwaite says in the film, you know, just before you go to that first thing, just have a think for a moment and maybe go to the next thing that actually will give you more satisfaction. It's just so easy, but the problem is, you know, I've made this film, I still do it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's why I feel so negative about it, because I don't feel I'm outside of it. It's like, um, it's unfortunately, it's a huge thing. It's, you know, listen to Russell Brand start a revolution. I don't know. It's kind of like, um, unfortunately, again, like, it, that's kind of at the point where I feel like it is like making a huge change will take a revolution at some point. And I, I think at the moment, but if, if we uh, slowly try, if, if everyone in their everyday life tries to take this on and maybe not take everything, again, no, that's really bad, I was gonna say, <laughs> don't take it so seriously, but it's like, it's kind of like when you're in a discussion with someone, don't get all right, try and let them see the humour in how stupid it is rather than be sort of very right on, very sort of worthy about it. I think both of us feel slightly awkward about the, I don't want to be sitting up here like going, this is how you should do things. No. Because it's exactly who am I Exactly, we've just made a fucking film that's yeah. kind of a stupid film that, you know, <laughs> we just did a thing and I don't think that qualifies no. us to be telling anyone how they should do anything, really. Exactly. We, don't, exactly. we don't think that we're somehow now, you know, I, I worked for them for two and a half years. Like, geez, I'm the last person in this room who should be telling anyone how to live their life. So, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, I, I think that's, that's a slightly awkward thing about the question. I just, I just feel slightly like, uh, I don't want to tell people how yeah, they should. We, how we they have no right to say that to anybody. But, it's just like... But I would like to say, while we're here, because I forget to say it, let me just say one thing. Um, we want to thank a few people um, for, for their help in the film, because this film has been made on literally, like, the smallest budget a film has ever been made on, I think. Uh, and We've, we've had to put a huge amount of effort in um, to, and call in a lot of favours to try and get it to, to what we think is a really good standard. And two of those people who've been amazing are Bob Strongman, who's done the, the graphics and animation, um, and, and Nick Norton-Smith, who's done the music. Uh, and both of them have, have, have sort of, you know, stepped into the breach uh, uh, and have been so patient with us and have, you know, never complained despite changing our mind here, there. And, and have really got paid tossle for in the process, um, and, and they and they're both amazing, fantastic, uh, creative people who can get a lot of money not working with us. And I, I, you know, they, they are certainly two people that um, you know we really wanted to say thank you to. The film just wouldn't be here without them. So uh, thank you. Dave Milkins and Ludovic Russo. Dave Milkins especially just helped make this edit what it is. I didn't like made it up as I went along, and Dave came in and helped me sort of make it what it is today. And Ludovic Russo did the grade on it, and it was incredible. And both of them just worked for nothing basically. And so yeah, thank you so much. And I am so there's there's other people that we haven't thanked for. No, one more person I'd like to thank is, is Andy Tyrrell. Who uh, is, ju is just uh, graduated from uh, Ravensbourne, which is uh, an editing school, uh, and as a fantastic editor who literally came out of nowhere, I was introduced to him when we were trying to do our rough cut to get it into to Sheffield Dockfest. We needed to have this rough cut time, and Tom was away, and, and this guy didn't know me from Adam, stepped into the breach, and literally put our rough cut together. Uh, he's a fantastic editor, he's got a massive future ahead of him editing, and, and you know, uh, yet again, 
um, you know, didn't have any obligation but got behind the project. And so massive thank you to him. I know he's here somewhere as well. So yeah, thank you. So, um, I'm sorry if you didn't get your questions in. Um, uh, after party, by the way, I forget, is, is just across the road from here, 150 yards up the road, there is a bar that's called the, uh, it's called Tipsy Bar, but it's, that name is nowhere. So, you wouldn't know that. Um, it, it, I think it's called the, the Showman's Guild, it says outside. There should be a poster for the film outside if they've done what I said. Uh, they may not have done. Um, but it's, it's 150 yards up the road. You'll find it. Uh, yeah, come for a drink. And Venezuelan food. They've got a Venezuelan pop-up restaurant in there. That'll be because obviously tabloids and Venezuelan food are uh, very, very linked together. Thanks once again. Thank you, everyone.